Good morning. Can you all hear me? Cool. Well, thank you all for coming so much, and welcome. To introduce myself, since you probably don't know me, um, I've only made two forum posts in my life, and they were both about this event. I'm Dylan Cromwell. I'm the VP of Development at Sociomantic Labs. I am a developer. I did one thing with D one time because my colleagues forced me. So I don't really know anything about D except for that I really like it, and I know a lot of people that I like who like it as well, and I do know some people who don't like it as much, but that's nice to have that controversy. You are at DCONF 2016, in case you're still jet-lagged and you're unsure of what you walked into. That's the first time it's in Europe. You probably already know that. It's really exciting for me. I hope it's exciting for you. Um, in my opinion, in my understanding, what the language is about is also what this conference is about, and that's all of you. So, of course, there are speakers up here, but the idea is that over the next three days, it's about all of you coming together. And also, we have this live stream so that the part of the community that isn't here can also join. So that spirit of open source, that spirit of building together, that's what DCOMP has really meant to me. And I'm not the owner of it, but I hope that you share in that same kind of ideology and that you find that the talks and up here and the talks down there really echo that. So that's enough from me for now. I will be your MC. So if I'm annoying already, I apologize, because you're going to get a lot of me. But luckily, we have Andre here. And if you don't know Andre, then you can feel free to get up and uh, go back out into Noikon. He's uh, one of, <laughs> can we say, founding fathers of the D language? Not quite. Architect is my title. Or founding parents, to be more gender neutral. <laughs> founding architects. Um, yeah, and so without further ado, he's going to kind of take the stage and, and let you know what's going on with him, what's Thanks. going on with the. Thank you, dear colleague. So, I did. All right. Well, that's why you should do these things beforehand, right? And I put full screen a different thing. There we go. Awesome. So I was off to a very energetic start, but that kind of took my thunder away right now. So um, my op opening keynote is um, appropriately entitled Opening Keynote. Um, it's very hard. I mean, this is like probably the hardest talk I had to prepare ever because, you know, like the opening keynote sets the stage for the whole conference because people come and sit and like, you know, there's like this conference and what am I doing here and like, I wish I hadn't eaten that burrito this morning and, you know, that kind of, it's like, what's going on and if I kind of trip and fall right now, which did happen, it's gonna, you know, it's all gonna, the whole conference is gonna be about that kind of stuff. If I coffee, it's gonna be all about, all about coffee and you know that kind of stuff. So, I really have to be very careful what I say. Uh, that being said, I'm going to start with how I met Dylan. Like it was like uh, 15 minutes ago. So, he, you know, we've emailed like we've sent back and forth like a million emails organizing this. And so, you know, finally this uh, guy shows up and says, "I'm Dylan." And there's this guy with a huge mole on his face. And I'm, I'm trying to be politically correct, so I don't look at his face for the next like 30 seconds or so because you don't stare, right? You don't do that. Finally, I figured it was the microphone. So, <laughs> all right. But now that, you know, it wouldn't have been anything wrong if he had like a huge mole like this big on his face. That, that's totally fine. All right. How about this for an appropriate introduction, right? So, uh, okay, of course this doesn't work. You bet. You bet your money. All right, I'm going to put the mouse in the middle so as to annoy everybody, like right here. <laughs> See, it annoys the heck out of you, doesn't it? All right. So welcome. I would like to uh, start by thanking Sociomantic for organizing this. Like, Walter and I are, like, ridiculously bad at organizing conferences. And we were to organize the DCONF, so uh, it was kind of a difficult task for us. 
And um, at some point, it just so happened that we, we were talking to, um, to uh, folks at Sociomani, and I said, you know, how about you organize it in Berlin? And it's going to be the home of the largest D user, and it's going to, we can help with it, and it, it's, uh, it's going to be awesome. And well, it depends on us to make it awesome because we have everything set up. Coffee is there, water is there, food is there, and you're here, and this is all about you, right? So it's fantastic. Um, so many thanks to Sociomantic. Please give, me, give yourselves a hand if you're from Sociomantic. If you're not, just give them a hand. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. This is awesome. This is just great. All right. So I'm just going to say a few random things about, uh, about our work the past year. And um, just to kind of uh, break the pattern totally, I'm going to introduce some completely inappropriate uh, picture here. These are my most important projects of the past year or so. So um, aside from that, I would like to um, you know, spend the first five minutes on the first five minutes. Um, this has come up repeatedly in our community, which is, it's, you know, the first five minutes set up the first five years. So Liran told me yesterday, it was a great one-liner. And um, one perennial issue with, uh, with, uh, with, with, our, uh, with the amenities we provide uh, with the D language is, you know, simply the first five minutes are not good. Who thinks the first five minutes are good? I'm not trying to single out people who say it's not good, right? Who thinks they're not good? So everybody, right? So essentially, like, I don't think the first five minutes we provide are, are the best they could be. And uh, that's a problem because people often, they don't, they don't want to learn a language. They start with, I want to do a task. I want to implement a server. I want to implement a site. I want to, uh, I want to do a little project. And they're going to choose a different language because that, that different language offers things like tutorials and easy to copy and paste code and uh, libraries that are easy and uh, you know, this kind of documentation and all of these kind of things. So I really wish we had a better first five minutes. And part of the, uh, part of the first five minutes is the dub experience. Does dub work? Right, another great one-liner, if it works sometimes, it doesn't work. You want it, so you want every project on Dub to work all the time. So you want to, you want to be very confident that if you go to, you know, if you have something to do and you go to Dub and you find something that kind of can help, if you download that thing, it's just going to compile, run, and do what you want it to do. If you have like two times this uh, experience in which you kind of it kind of doesn't work, it doesn't build, or it kind of builds and then doesn't run properly, and the documentation is inadequate, and it's just, you know what, I'm going to write this on my own. Right, so um, one great idea that Walter had was to self-curate Dub. One good theme for us to follow is automate everything that can be automated, right? And to automate everything that can be automated, that for Dub means Things like if a project doesn't build, it should be like gray. Like on the list of things, it should be just a, an unattractive color, like brown. <laughs> it's some really it kind of, and it goes, it goes more faint the more it doesn't build. So I don't know if, with time it just goes worse from worse to worse, and at some point it becomes white on white, and we're done, right? You see what I'm saying? So, you know, it would be great to have that kind of system in place. Also, like, you know, how many times this project has been, there's some sort of a ranking system. You know, people download this and like it, people download this and didn't, didn't like it, you know, nobody looks at this, etc. And to have that kind of ranking system and this kind of automated testing would go a long way toward making Dub more convivial. That would be pretty awesome. So I would like to thank everybody for a great year. It's been a good year for D. Um, look at us. Like the conference size has doubled, more than doubled. We have like live streaming, and we have uh, you know we have an, right now with the conference has an air of professionalism as opposed to in the previous years. It was good, but it was like only the core contributors would come. And now I'm seeing you know I'm amazed that I'm glad to see people I don't know. So I, I look at you guys, and it's like, oh, I don't know that guy, I don't know that guy. You know, so it's like awesome 
because there's people I don't know about who, uh, who are here and kind of interested. I hope uh, they're not going to leave right after this talk. It's like, oh man, I came here. It's just terrible. I'm going to go back to work, get some work done. So we've had a, a very good experience with, uh, with kind of establishing points of contact kind of directory. And I want to continue that. Point of contact means there's a person who is not necessarily responsible for that thing, but it's accountable. That's a slight difference, meaning if, there's, if something on the website doesn't work, I can write Vladimir, Cyber Shadow. I can write him an email and say, Vladimir, what's going on with the website? And he doesn't need to fix it. He needs to pursue, he needs to delegate whatever happens to the person who can fix it. But the important thing is there's a point of contact as opposed to, well, uh, guys, the website, there's something with the website here and it's just messed up and uh, pff, what's happening? Who did this or, you know, what's going on? As long as it's a vague request, it's not going to work well. But if there's a point of contact, there's somebody who is going to follow through with it, right? And uh, that has worked well with, uh, Martin. where's Martin? Martin, Martin Novak. There he is in the back. Give him a hand for the build system. That's awesome. This is just great. It's amazing. So this guy comes out, out of nowhere and establishes himself as the build czar. And just, he does it. And he does it well, and he does it great, and he's reliable, and he just does it. And that's amazing. It's been a great, a great thing. We have a very good uh, sysadmin, Jan Knepper. He's not here. He's in Jersey. So Jan is our sysadmin. Whenever I ask anything of him, he would just sit down and do it. And um, I wish we had, and you know, this is about you. I'm, I'm telling you, this is about every one of you. And you're sitting there, it's like, you know, this guy can't be speaking about me in particular. It's not me, it's everybody else. Like, look to your left and right, you know, it's not me. It's you, my friend. It's you, yeah? I'm looking at you. And what I mean by that is, everybody who's sitting right now and saying, you know, eh, well, uh, how long is from this talk, like, right? Um, everybody of us can do something. And that, it's not hard things. For example, uh, I'm the, by fiat, I am the PR, media, Twitter, Reddit, Facebook uh, responsible. Just because there's nobody else, because somebody has to do it. Right? I'm, I'm doing a lousy job at it. I hate people. <laughs> I'm... <laughs> I'm like, I'm terrible, right? I'm not a good guy for that kind of stuff, right? And even if I were, it's not the thing that, you know, it's not, it's not my best thing. It's not the thing that, uh, that, that's most important, that's most, that I'd be most important for community, right? But because I need to do all these little things, I find less focus for the big things. So if, if uh, somebody takes the little things, that would be awesome. There's a lot of stuff that I cannot delegate. Uh, speaking of a good year, uh, this has been a year in which there's been a, a net increase in demand for detraining. I'm very happy to say that. Um, I'm coming, just a week ago, there's been the ACCU conference, and I held their, um, uh, day, a day-long workshop for the D-language. And uh, at NDC in Oslo uh, in June, there's going to be another one, day-long workshop for the D-language, and people actually pay money to come and learn about D, which is awesome. Um, and these, these are kind of things uh, that I can't delegate. Because my name is part of it. I can't say, oh, uh, yeah, thanks for the invite. Uh, I'm going to send this guy instead, right? It, it, you can't do that, right? But we can do a lot of things together uh, that are, that, you know, that in, in, um, in aggregate are going to mean a lot. So if you want to take any responsibility, there's so many little things that you can do. And if you want to become a point of contact for things like uh, PR, Webmaster, social media, conference organizer, these would be great. So we've been benefiting from Sociomantic this year. I hope to tap them for what they're worth. I hope to like, get them to organize all, all DECONF conferences in the future, um, until the singularity, of course. Um, right? The rapture. <laughs> but um, you know, my point here being that Walter and I have been doing a lot of stuff that we're terrible at. I'm not, I'm not kidding, we're like really lousy. Like for example, like there would be some task like related to organize the conference, I would, I'd be like thinking, I'm terrible at this, let me let Walter, and then I'd be like, oh my God, I should have done that. <laughs> so, 
I see him laughing there in the back. Is that is that grin? Yeah. All right. All right. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> so get me fired. I'm in charge of too many things. I don't have envy. I'm, I want D to succeed. I don't want to be, you know, because at some point I remember there's a message in a news group. Somebody said, I wonder if Andre would be okay with that. Or some sort of like implying some, bestowing some authority on me that I didn't know I had. That's like, of course, I mean, I mean, this is good. Why wouldn't I be, why would I be against that? Because it undermines my authority or what's, uh, you know, I have no envy. I'm like, it's a condition. I'm not kidding. This is like the confession part of the, this talk. I, I was born with no envy. I'm not kidding. So like some people don't have like sensitivity in the thumb or whatever. It's, I don't have envy. It's just weird. And it's been like hard. I realized it in my teen years that I, have, I don't have that feeling. So it's been kind of a very interesting life because you, kind of, you can't connect to people because you think they have no envy and you kind of you brag because you think they're going to be happy because you're happy and they're not going to be happy. It's kind of a weird thing. So end of confession right now. Said too much already. So I don't have envy. If, if you do something, anything I do better than me, this is not a constant sun game. We all win. This is not day trading. If you win, it doesn't mean I lose. <laughs> it's not day trading. It's not hedge funds. All right? We can all add value. So if you can do something better than me, just do it. Do it over me. Destroy me. Right? Make me envious. Make me feel it for once. Right? <laughs> Bring that to me. Right? Okay. I'm in charge of too many things. And this, this uh, Walter too, we're just two folks kind of carrying just a lot of little things. And that's, um, you know, for example, I, I know only, only one guy who can, I don't know, add a new object for, for format for the compiler. There's one, I know only Walter. And maybe Ian, like, oh, there's this is a few, very few people. Why do you want to use those people to, oh, Walter, you got to update that Twitter account because for God's sake, what's, going, what's wrong with you, right? You can't have these people do that. Make them do what they're very good at, right? All right. Oh, of course it doesn't work anymore. Huh? All right. So next thing I wanted to talk about just a bit is raising the bar on contributions. And again, this is about you. It's not about me because I only write great code. My bar is really high already. I'm awesome, right? I was kidding. I was kidding. I have a lot of reasons to be modest about, right? So, um, but overall, I think uh, we have a problem with OK work. There's a lot of OK work in our community right now. And that's a problem. You know what OK work is? It's work that is going to make it in the repository. OK work is work that's going to be accepted because it's OK. And that's the main problem. Bad work, I prefer bad work to OK work. Because bad work, I know how to reject. Bad work is like, you know, this is crap. I'm not going to you know, close this pull request. Right? I know bad work I can handle. I'm very good at handling bad work. I'm not good at handling OK work, which is like, eh, that's pretty mediocre, but you know, we, what can I do here? Well, let me pull it. We don't want OK work. We want great work. We want only the best work you can possibly do, humanly possible, until you die. We want that work. Like, you're, you're within an inch of your death doing your best work of your life, and I, I want that work. Give me that work, OK? I want your best absolute work possible, humanly imaginable. The best work, we, I, I want a pull request like, oh my God, it's the monitor shines, right? That kind of work I want. I want like, a work that's going to be like completely enthralling, yes? Buy a CRT, it's going to shine. What? <laughs> Buy a CRT, it's going to shine. It's going to throw all those electrons at you. <clears throat> so I want your best work. I want great work. We have too much good work. We have two, 300 pull requests. It's good work. And the problem with good work is like it's very hard to kind of figure out if, if, how much value it adds, right? So in that, on that theme, reasons to not pull something. You don't want to pull that work. Why not? I don't see any reason. For, I remember distinctly this sentence being written by somebody who's maybe in this room even. 
or maybe on the live stream, you're there. I know you. I know you are. So, you know, I don't see any reason not to pull this. That's a, you know, at that point, you should close the pull request. I, I give you authority to close that pull request. No questions asked. That's not a reason to get something in, just because you don't find a reason not to. So double negation here doesn't work to affirmation. It's like, it's like Romanian Russian in which you say no twice and it still counts as a no. I'm not kidding. This is like, in English you say, you don't say like, I don't see nothing. Although it's vernacular, right? So people say it to be funny. I don't, see no, I don't say nothing or I don't see nothing or, you know? But um, in English you say I don't see anything, right? Or I see nothing. In Russian and Romanian, you actually say, uh, I don't see nothing, and it's correct. And it cancels a no, right? So, why not is not a reason. Does anybody have uh, anything to... Do I hear some dissension here? All right. I'm glad they gave me this microphone, because then hecklers cannot go like, well, you know, I hate you. All right. A respected contributor. That's not a reason to pull his work or her work. It's not a reason. Just I don't care. How about I don't care you're respected? It's, if it's crappy work, it's crappy work. Judge it on its own merit, right? It's terrible. If it's terrible, don't pull it. Nobody has a license to uh, put in like bad work and just write it. That applies to me and Walter as well, definitely. A lot of work, that's my favorite. I did notice that he put a lot of work into that. We should just pull that. What's wrong with that? Can, can anybody tell us? Reward yes. What? It does, it does reward inefficiency. Awesome. That's, that sounds great. That's a good one. John. The whole Marxist uh, you know, thing. <laughs> right. So it's a Marxist theory of labor, you know, value, whatever they hold, you know, right. What else, right? So it's, it's bad, right? It's, it rewards working hard but not smart. You don't want that. Yes, heckle. So Walter's uh, point here was uh, hedge your efforts. If you, if you are going to work on something that takes a lot of time, then you want to hedge that, but you want to ask beforehand, is this going to be valuable or not? And uh, just make sure you, you gauge interest beforehand. Um, actually, I disagree a bit about that. And I have the microphone, so I don't care. So <laughs> I disagree just a bit, just a bit. It's a good point. But I also see... Uh, that can also backfire, because if there's something that needs a lot of good work, a lot of work, it's likely it's going to be a great idea. And it's difficult to gauge people on, you know, I have this great idea, but before you even see it, I want to ask if you'd be interested. It's hard. You know, and so I would like, to, I would like people to be confident, to say, you know what, I'm going to work on this, and um, I'm sure it's going to be a great idea, and therefore it's going to be pulled. I don't, I, you know, the only fault that uh, we, sort of the leaders of the community, many of whom are in this room right now, the, the worst thing we can do is ignore very good work. But I, I, think we can be, uh, I think we can be good at recognizing good work. I think the problem is more that it's just not very good work and then there's just a lot of argument around like good work because it's not, just not great and it's debatable, right? So, renames. We've been over this like many times. Like renaming a variable from x to y, awesome. Gotta love it, right? You don't, you know, let's forget about that. Refactoring, showing no clear improvement, which is just churning illusion of progress. There's, there's been a lot of cases like that in which, you know, we're like, you know, dogs sharing a territory here, and whenever a new dog comes, they're gonna have to pee on all trees there, right? Kind of put their trace, the scent. You, the, you know what I'm talking about? Like the dogs marking the territory is like an animal thing. Don't you watch Animal Planet, guys? What's <laughs> happening here? So, you know, everybody needs to, like, whenever I see some piece of code, I feel a, a huge urge to refactor it. And guess what? I learn how to resist it. Right? Don't refactor it. Like, you don't have to put your style on, you know, wherever you work. Just work with whatever is there, because, you know, if it's terrible, change it. But, you know, if it's just not your cup of tea, just, you know, be, be a professional about it. 
There's just a lot, a lot of stuff, you know. Ah, I worked on this code, so I took the opportunity to change like the 10 files that are uh, within the, start with the same letter, <laughs> right? And I just took that opportunity. It's like a huge diff. Showing like you look at this and you're thinking, if I pull this, is this gonna make any change, any you know, any improvement to the code base? No, of course not. It's just gonna be there. It's gonna be a, some other guy's style, and then you know another guy comes and changes that style, etc. Et so you don't want that. All right. So, what are good reasons? So there's a few vague things on the slide, but I can make them more concrete. You know, the, the most important things is you got to feel that your contribution adds value to the language, right? Adds value. And that has many forms, right? It just adds a valuable thing, and it's awesome, and it's great, and everybody's going to love it. Whenever I feel that your, whatever your contribution is to the, you know, to the website itself, to the language, to the library, to the compiler, to you know, fix you know, anything, right? If you feel after this is going to be pulled, we're going to be an inch closer to good, to, to a good state, right? That's going to be awesome. Refactors for a net benefit. I've seen good refactorings, um, some of which are authored by Walter himself. You know, add cost, add pure to functions, make the compiler, you know, make the code better, well, better to be um, uh, more maintainable. Um, add abstraction, you know, make, make it more modular. There's so many opportunities there. It almost hurts. So those are good pull requests, and I'm gonna be like, oh, this is good work, so I can pull that. And we need that kind of work. We don't need formatting, right? By the way, about formatting, so, um, I find it awesome that there's this guy, uh, Sebastian, who came out of nowhere, he's a student. He, uh, he got the Google Summer of Code project, and he kind of like, in the first week, he already contributed like a lot, because he added this, um, he added a style checker from, uh, by Brian Schott, and he made, it, he made everything automatic, so you can't actually put in code that has the wrong formatting, which is awesome, and we should continue doing that. Automation is great, actually it's there. Automates, the first to last one. So let me continue here. Uh, fixes a bug positively. Fixes a bug without actually decreasing the quality of the code. So we want good fixes, not bad, bad fixes. There's been cases in which we had fixes that would fix the particular issue, but they would leave more technical debt for folks following that. Well, you don't want that, right? All right. Makes code simpler. Simplicity is hugely underrated in our job, generally. I see some nods from the audience here. Like there's, you know, maybe one of the hardest thing is to find like the simplest incarnation of a concept. It's very difficult. And um, it's part, part of what the reason it's difficult is that people, many people don't see its value. So not say many, but many of us, some of us don't see its value. It, it has value to find simplicity. Um, and so the opposite of it is it's complicated, therefore it must be interesting. I'm not kidding. But do you agree or disagree? We have an agreement for Amori. Write it down. So, <laughs> so uh, by the way, I hope they have, they, I hope they have microphone in, microphones in the room because I remember like I gave a conference talk once and I have the very directional microphone. And what happened was like, the, the recording after that, it was like, I was cracking jokes, and people would love it, but they, the laughter was not captured. <laughs> so it looked like, and everyone was like, oh my god, this guy has a tough audience right there. <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> so, yes, you're laughing, yes, I can hear it. All right, so, um, it's very hard to find simplicity, and it's, it's a skill. And actually, the, the best thing that I can do is to tell you that it's important, because Many people, like many, especially like uh, students, beginners, they don't understand that simplicity is good. They think complexity is good. They think it's, I'm working, I wrote 1,000 lines of D, kind of thing, you know? So I kind of cracked the barrier there. I write 1,000 lines, I wrote 10,000 lines or whatever, you know? I wrote a bunch of code. And that's not necessarily what you want to aim for, right? Maybe like one line well placed is gonna make the whole difference. All right, makes code faster. Speed of compilation and speed of execution have been perennial advantages of D, and we don't want to lose those. 
So speed of compilation is speed of execution. They're always high ranked. Everybody loves that. Right? We want to keep those. It's, um, there's just plenty of opportunity there in the standard library and then even the compiler. Just so much opportunity to make the code better, faster, and simpler. Automate. Automate everything that you can possibly automate. This is a huge. Automation is great. Um, speaking of which, Dub is very interesting. A very interesting idea to make Dub self-curating. Automation, make everything that's trivial that we discuss all the time about formatting and style, just automate it, automate everything. And improve documentation, this is great when you only have a little time. When you just have like, you know, I'm, I'm, a, busy, I'm a busy person working day in, day out, and I have like 10 minutes right now to improve things. What can you do? You can improve the documentation. There's always something to be improved there. You have an example, you have a little, you know, you have a little thing, you can contribute, you, can, you find a bug, you have, find a typo. Like documentation is important, it's part of the first five minutes. And the first five minutes, I'm sure they cost us a lot of potential users because they look at it and they're like, oh my God, this documentation is like, I'm not seeing an example here. There's a bunch of functions that have zero examples. Like zero, and the, and the signature is like five lines long. You know, because it has the constraints and everything. It's kind of, it's a politically correct signature, right? It's, it's, the, it's the right, it, it wins. The signature wins the debate. You see what I'm saying? It's, it's good in debate class, right? It's a signature like, oh, I know, where, I know why everything is here. Yeah, this end here, I know exactly why, it is, why it's there, right? So you have the long, you have the very detailed signature, which makes the function very powerful and very general. Awesome. But then it's like very complicated to follow for the beginning. You know, I just wanted to see if a string starts with another string. And you're showing me this? Jesus. You know, I'm, let me use go instead where I write it by hand like an idiot, right? But, you know, what are you going to do? <laughs> All right, you should delete that from the... <laughs> in post-processing. So, all right. Um, I noticed that, uh, at least for me, like I'm saying here, talent times time equals win. And that's actually a, a, it's a, it's a rigorously mathematical equation right there. I noticed that my IQ like halves with every like uh, shortening of the time, right? That there's, a, there's a very precise phenomenon in which the, le the less time I have for something, the more my IQ like decreases like on an exponential curve right there. So, you know, by the time I have like one minute to decide something, I'm like IQ 50. Like I, I'm in serious need of help there, right? For example, I'm like, I've been in this situation. I have, I have 30 seconds to decide where I like, add this name to the standard library or not. And you know, sometimes I go back and look like, who the hell approved this? This is like crap. Who and I look in the history and it's like, oh, it was me. Jesus, <laughs> it's terrible. So, you know, talent times time. It's, it, we want your, I know you're talented. I know there's a lot of good people in this room, online, like, who are contributing to D and who could contribute to D. Uh, we need to kind of find ways to get their time, um, get their attention more. Because talent times time is win. We have much talent, but we, you know, we don't have enough uh, paid contributors. I'm going to get back to that in the, in the end of my talk. All right, let me talk now about resource management. Just a few words. All right. So, the garbage has had to go. We got to take it out. We're committed to this. All right. So, the GC is great when you have a short script. It's an awesome way to lift cycles. It's very good to have. I'm, I'm glad we have it. But we want to make D a very good environment for people who, are, who don't want to use the GC at all, or want to use it very sparingly, or you know, just don't care for it. So we, we want to actually make this a priority for the rest of the year. And to that end, uh, we want to add a means to do reference counting in a safe way. So this is sort of the top of the, you know, the top of the shelf right now. The front burner is make res uh, reference counting work safely with, uh, with D. Okay? 
Overall, I find, you know, who thinks uh, reference counting is a good thing? Like, raise your hand. Who thinks it's a terrible thing? And you know, you're, you're all right. You know, who doesn't care? You're all right, okay? Everybody's right. It's a, qualified, it's a qualified success. You know, sometimes it's terrible to use reference counting for some. It's awful. You don't want to do it for like the most intensely used uh, core loops and kind of just uh, the increment and decrement that reference count. It's terrible, right? And that's happened, that happens in languages that do it transparently and for everything. So, yes? Intrusive reference counting is better than uh, non-intrusive reference counting for per, uh, performance-wise, uh, but it's still overhead. Uh, actually, uh, early versions of Lisp did use intrusive reference counting, and they were just very slow. So reference counting is a way to sort of divide the, the cost of resource management. It's like divided evenly across the, uh, the run of the application, whereas the garbage collection concentrates it in a few, uh, in a few spots, right? And Either approach is good sometimes and bad sometimes. But anyhow, we have a, a few sp sp problems specific to D with reference counting. One of them is make it work with immutable. So you, you know, which is weird because reference counting means there's something that kind of spins there, like goes up and down. And uh, immutable means it's gonna, never gonna change. So there's a problem there, right? We wanna make it safe. We want to work it with uh, classes and with values, with structs. We want it to work lazily, like copy and write approaches, because we don't like the, the approach of C++ where copying an object can have an arbitrary high cost, right? So you want to uh, solve all, all of these issues. And um, a good baseline is the C++ way of doing things, which has goods and bads about it. So in C++, reference counting is done as a library, shared pointer. And they're great because they apply to any type, and they're bad because they apply to any type. What do you think I mean by that? Why is it good that they apply to any type? Why is it a good thing? Huh? You just use it everywhere, so you can use it with any, you, you don't need to change your type to make it uh, usable with reference count. Why is it bad? This is sort of the more interesting. Why is it bad? Yes, Stefan. Maybe you want to use a special code path when reference count is involved. Uh, what other reasons? Yes. Uh, to reference? Oh, reference, yeah, cycles. So you, you may run into cycles without understanding it very properly. And actually, a lot of code is more, um, uh, is more you know, vulnerable to, to cycles than ma many people think. Um, one other thing is um, it's unsafe. Like you can use shared pointer in C++ with types that return pointers from inside themselves. So it returns a pointer to some handle inside that's held inside. As soon as that shared pointer goes away, the pointer is dangling. So essentially it's just a convention that you use shared pointer, but it comes with a heavy collection of conventions that you need to follow in order to use it properly. And we don't want to do that for D. We don't want to do uh, prayer-oriented programming, right? POP, that's a nice ac acronym right there. We don't want to do POP, right? So we want to just make sure that if a type is reference content, it's also going to be saved just by, you know, you prepend save there and you're done. And in order to enable that type checking, that's sort of the difficult part, right? Uh, and also one thing that I don't like about the C++ approach is that it needs mutable. You know, mutable keyword in C++, you know, it, you know what it says? You know what mutable is? Who knows? Tell me. Uh, mutable, what does it do? Mutable allows you to change a uh, member even in C++. It allows you to change a member even, even if the function is const. Um, even if the object is const. So you know what it really means? Oh, remember that const? You know? <laughs> you, I was kidding. It's not. And actually, like, uh, C++ uh, 11 or 14, I forgot which, actually forbids use of mutable in standard containers. Why? Because you don't like you don't like that, right? It's terrible. So it guarantees that it uses no mutable data. So then you can use it with uh, with threads, and you can use uh, reader writers locks with uh, multiple threads. So you know we don't have mutable. 
It's too unwieldy. We could add a whole facility. It's been discussed before. We could add a very complicated facility to build a restricted mutable. But, you know, it's terrible. It's just very difficult, right? So we need to fix all of this stuff. What uh, we envision here is we want to add language support and library hooks. So the language must know something about reference counting. So it has an idea that it doesn't allow you to escape pointers, for example, from reference counted objects. Uh, but at the same time, it should give you the opportunity to write your own routines for doing so. Maybe you want intrusive, maybe you want whatever, right? Maybe you want a short account or whatnot. So op incref and op decref would be automatically called most of the time with one here, but sometimes with something greater than one, and I'll get to that in a minute, right? So I'm adding this many references to the object, and I'm decreasing this many references from the object. About immutable, uh, what safety? So this is sort of the smoking gun of, uh, of safety. Uh, just a quick code example here. So we have a structure that's supposed to be reference counting and has some member, an integer, and I'm writing a function that takes the object by reference and an integer by reference. And then I'm going to create an object in uh, the second function, gun, here, and I'm going to pass simultaneously the a reference to the object and a reference to something inside the object at the same time. What's going to happen next? Nobody knows. You know, that's a, it's undefined behavior because once you, once you assign that object on the first line of fun, assuming the reference count was one, the object is going to be the, demolished. It's going to be reinitialized with something else. The old object is just going to go away because you have a reference count of one. So then you have what you still have, you have a reference to its guts, to that integer that's inside the object. And this is not a matter of encapsulation because you, in, that int a can be a function that returns a reference or whatever. So it's not a matter of encapsulation. It's a matter of safety. So the way we want to attack that, so we think of a number of scenarios. This is a known, I think Amori was the first to, uh, to um, write these examples, you know, Timon. So we had a couple of folks who kind of, uh, analyze this, and sort of the conservative approach to this, which we're going to take initially, would be just add extra increments and decrements for ref parameters. Whenever you pass a reference to such an object or any part of it, just add one extra. And you know, beware, this may be free, because that may mean replacing one with two here. And the cost of adding one or two or a thousand is the same. So they're going to be fused together. So there's not necessarily a loss of efficiency, right? Um, there's a variant with uh, globals can also kind of wreck things up uh, pretty badly. So this is, is going to solve it, essentially. Like just whenever you have references, just uh, the compiler conservatively just inserts new, um, more references. And it may actually conservatively even insert more than necessary. It could insert, you know what, let me add 10 for five parameters. Let me add 10 conservative, and it's just totally fine, right? All right. Immutable. This is, the, this, this is the most fun part of the whole thing. Immutable. So immutable means I never change, honey. It's I'm, I'll always love you, and I'll always be the same great guy, right? But you know, in fact, reference counting is cheating, right? <laughs> right? You're cheating. You're actually changing things. Right? It's not nice. It's not good, especially with threads. Like immutable means you can actually share it across threads. And reference counting means, oh, actually, I need to change this. And I'm not sure if it's shared or not. It's terrible. Right? So well, we consider actually, so I went as far as a revo thinking, you know what? You can't have an object that's reference counted and immutable. And I got promptly destroyed by the entire community. They're like, you know, you gave me a language. I want to use it. How about that? Right? You gave me a keyword, you gave me a capability, how about you let me use it? So we gotta, you got to find something. And you know, if only we had a means to allocate some metadata with each object and give a means to access it and fast and give it a different type, that would be awesome. Which takes me to a correspondence with Dicebot, who's famously around here. Where are you? Awesome. This is he. Dicebot, a.k.a. Mihals. So he said, why do you completely discard 
This drove me mad. It drove my blood pressure up. <laughs> Why do you completely discard? Like, he didn't miss words, okay? Uh, the whole notion of external reference counting approach, sharing, storing ref count in the GC allocator. And you know, I, this got me really mad. And you know why? Because he thought I'm bad, but I was incompetent. <laughs> I mean, you know, there's this famous quote. Why does he think I dismissed it when I didn't see it? I was an idiot. So mind this, OK? So he gave me this awesome idea. So he came with this great idea. It's like in the form of why are you such, why are you such a bad person that you don't want to do this obviously good thing? And I was like, that is an obviously good thing. I just didn't think of it. <laughs> right? So awesome. And actually, I wrote the code. This is terrible. This is like a shame. There's affix allocator. It was from day one. It was it was one of the first allocators that are interesting in uh, the whole allocator package, which goes if you say affix allocator of some allocator in comma u int or whatever type you want, it's going to automatically allocate the u int before the allocation, and it's going to type it separately from the object being allocated. Which oh wait a minute, it's exactly what I needed. It's exactly what I needed. Right, so you want that thing, and it's going to be typed separately. It's going to, not going to be immutable, and the allocator knows it's not immutable because it's the allocator. So it, it knows how the kind of the memory is typed. Right, it knows it's mutable. Right, so it's going to uh, give you this extra data, awesomely with a uh, uint in the front and uh, accessible immediately. Right. So the question is, how do you use it? Because you, you're getting an object, but the object is immutable. And then how do you kind of what's going on with that? Actually, the, uh, with this scheme, the, the reference count is not part of the data. It's not in the, with the data. It's in, conceptually, it's in a hash table that maps every data to a uint. What practically happens is the elements are next to each other. Right? And the way you access that extra data is the allocator has a method for it. But it's the allocator has a method for it, and it's gonna, it knows. It can cast away the immutable, because it knows what the real type of the prefix is. Right? So that solves everything beautifully. So I'm, I'm very, you know, in, a, in a way, I'm very happy I was just an idiot and not really bad, because if I were bad, that would be a completely different problem, right? So. <clears throat> Use this allocator for creating all RC objects and problem solved. We have it. Yes. How does it solve the multi-threading access? I'm glad you, you asked that. So for mutable objects, they're not shareable, so you're done. So if it's mutable, you get the reference count, it's mutable as well, you're done, right? For const data, you don't know whether it's immutable or not. So you gotta use conservatively atomic reference counting. For immutable objects, again, you know what's going on, right? So depending on the type of the payload, you actually have a good hunch on the type of the, uh, on whether or not you should be using uh, locked increment or not. Yes? Um, and shared? Shared, shared is the same deal. Once the data is shared, the, the, the uh, reference count is shared by default. There's no other way, right? So there's a little heuristics there, and I have that pull request that has been pulled recently which, uh, depending on the type of the payload, you kind of make an inference about the type of the, uh, of the, um, the reference count. And that works awesomely. It's going to be great. Consider that, for example, in C++, shared pointer needs conservatively to, to always use atomic increment. And, you know, it's been successful. I mean, it works. So we can do even better. So then I'm happy, right? All right. We have 10, 10 more minutes. Uh, I'm going to eat into the break here. Um, I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the library that I worked on recently, which I find interesting. And it's a good example of a library that's using the power of D in a way that is dif difficult for other languages to tap into. So I call it Big O. And it's about complexity. So consider this. You know, the Big O notation, O of N, O of N log N, that kind of stuff, right? So you have these things, and um, it's a very nice uh, information about an algorithm. It's very nice to know, oh, this algorithm is linear, this is uh, you know, n log n, this is logarithmic, this is uh, constant time, et cetera. 
So it's a nice piece of information to have. So <clears throat> usually put, people put that in the documentation. Oh, actually, to get to the nth element of a list, you got to do O of n, that kind of stuff, right? So as long as you have non-generic code, you, get, you can easily prove things with pen and paper. Not easily, always, but you know, often, right? Great. What I want here, and this is the theme of the rest of the talk, is I want to make the big O information about any algorithm generic and discoverable statically during compilation. And it came from my containers library, which I was working on, and I discovered that I have a problem. Because I did want to encode, I did want this information. It's important for a container to know how much it's going to cost to insert a thing in the middle of the container, right? It's important. It's a, it's a good, it's, a, it's, a fe it's part of the features of the container. It's part of the performance characteristics. It's very important. So then we have, uh, <laughs> at some point I had like this weird like, remove lint time and remove log time and remove like whatever. And it was kind of a weird convention that didn't scale at all. And uh, even worse, you need to have like, some sort of a hierarchy of speeds because consider this. Let's say I want to remove something from a container and I don't care if it's linear or, or faster. So linear or faster should be good for me. So I write remove lint time, right? And what if the container takes it in constant time? Is that acceptable? Is that okay? Yeah, it should just work. I mean, just pick it up because uh, linear is you know, slower than constant time, so you're even better, right? So that kind of contract programming. So you need to kind of write aliases all, all, all over the place like an idiot. Oh, if it's lint time, then log time should work as well and constant time should work as well. So it's kind of a tricky thing to get into. So <clears throat> when you have like higher order functions, it's even worse because you don't know what the higher, you know, you don't know what if you call a function n times, you got to know the complexity of that guy to make any assessment of complexity. So it's kind of a bummer. So there's a bunch of related work actually. Uh, Java started by just ignoring it completely. And then they kind of asked, uh, we need kind of marker interfaces, random access, and they allow dynamic introspection on that. So <clears throat> STL kind of uh, is very uh, concerned with, uh, with performance, with uh, complexity. So it has these nice examples in which push front is only defined if it's fast. Otherwise, you use a longer call. It's kind of a more complicated call, right? So, um, however, with the STL, it's unclear how you go, like, do I go best effort or, or do I go, like, uh, present or not? For example, distance is a best effort kind of function, so I'm going to work with any pair of iterators, even though they are, like, too slow. So, there's uh, some related work here that uh, is interesting because, for example, you can, you can type check a program, and if it's not running in linear time, it's just not going to type check, which is interesting. Right? But I didn't want to go that far, right? What we want here to do is the user introduces the annotation, so you trust the user, and defines the composition. And the framework does the algebra, propagates attributes, and stuff like that. So let me show you what, uh, what it looks like. We have a doubly linked list, and we have an array. And the doubly linked list has at O of 1, and the, uh, the array has at O of n. Neat, huh? This was the point where like, everybody's like, oh my god, that's really cool. Yeah, tell us more, Andre, about this all. Don't worry, I, I'm, I will. <laughs> so then you can do things like, well, if I have this container, which is generic, I don't know what the container is, I can statically assert that the comp uh, I can say that the complexity is going to be the complexity of inserting front times O of n2, the second parameter. So you get to do this little algebra there, right? And you can static assert that the complexity is not too high. During compilation, you can refuse to compile if you get quadratic complexity, which is awesome. Right, this is exactly the kind of thing that nobody can do because this uses at the same time attributes and compile time evaluation. Not everybody's got it, both, right? So there, there are conventions like you, know, you denote like nk for the kth parameter, or n if there's only one. And uh, Timon came with this great algebra, which goes like this. Here's a term. I swear, this is the only math you're going to see today, right? The only like font math, math font. So 
um, you can express things like log n and n log n, square root of n1 plus n2, you know, because it's a sum of products of atoms. And there's a simple algebra associated with that. So anyhow, I just want to give you an idea of, of what this works, of how this works. And uh, soon, soon enough, I'm going to submit this library for, uh, for your review in, uh, in Phobos. I think it's a great example of something that's sort of meta, because it's not the library, but it allows other libraries to be written, which is interesting. I have uh, one last thought before I finish here five minutes into the break. One really last thing. So, you know, I've been talking in the beginning about scaling up, and I've been talking about things that, you know, I, I want your time. You know, it's sort of in a way, we have your talent, but we need your time as well. And the part of scale, you know, a, a simple way to scale up is what? What's a simple way to scale up an organization? More people. More people. How do you get more people? Money, hire them, money. So I've been starting to think, you know, how can I get money for this organization, right? So, you know, I panhandle a bit on the freeway there. It didn't work very well. Um, I actually start talking to people. And um, funny enough, actually, uh, they come to me. So somebody came to me and said, you know what? I want to invest in the D language, half a million dollars. You know what my first question was? <laughs> Are you on drugs? <laughs> it was, oh, those might be like Zimbabwean dollars, right? <laughs> right? So he said, no, it's just, you know, American dollars. So there's, there's, some, there's an idiot out there. Sorry. <laughs> so who is like, you know, I want to invest half a million dollars in the D language. Um, but they said, you know, you need to have a plan. You need to have a plan. Because I, I, you know, if I give you money and don't know what to do with them, it's as bad as if you don't have any money in the first place. So um, we need to work on this. And we need to work on this. And I'm going to have these uh, hallway discussions with uh, top members of the community. We need to find a way to um, have a plan to use money without offending existing free contributors. Because there's a lot of people who put their, you know, their blood and sweat on their free time for no money into the D language. And the question is, how do, we, you know, how do we reward those for what they do properly? And how do we attract new folks into, uh, into the community to essentially you know, have employees who do great work, right? So um, I think this is a good topic to kind of end the whole discussion because I, I, hear, like, I hear a dead silence right here. I'm not sure if this is a good, bad, a good sign or a bad sign. And like everyone's like, oh my god, this is happening, I guess. So. All right, I'm done. Thank you very much. You're great. Thank you. Thanks. Stay here. Andre, I actually want you to stay here for just a minute. We have a... I'm going to hijack five minutes. Sure. If that's okay. You can actually keep your mic on. Oh, okay. Thanks. I'm going to need you. We're going to do an experiment on Andre right now. That's okay with everybody? Quick interactive session? It's okay with everybody, but not with me. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're at our mercy. That's democracy for you. Yeah. Democracy, yeah. Oh. Am I? I hope I don't need to code uh, like right now. You're going to live code JavaScript. Uh, dude. <laughs> <laughs> I thought I had that security guy at the door. Go, no JavaScript programmers. So, yeah. I'm actually not joking. Here's the JavaScript. Uh, no, okay, I'm kidding. Um, so, I want to play a guessing game. All right. Let's see. Um. <laughs> okay, so that, I guess that means people know who this is. If you, if you don't, it's Walter Bright. He's, he's in the back. Walter Bright in the dark. And uh, why do we have an illustrated picture of Walter Bright? Um, it actually gets even better. Um, we actually made a T-shirt at Sociomantic <laughs> years ago. I don't think any of us had even met Walter. We certainly didn't meet Andre. Uh, Andre. And uh, we, we, uh, we were so in, in awe, kind of, of, of the community that, that we started like, worshiping. And we made this, um, you know. <laughs> <laughs> There's a temple somewhere, right? I have like a street background, so that's where the homeboy comes from. But it was this parody of the Jesus is my homeboy 
uh, t-shirt. No, no offense to any religions. It's a, you know, it's a pop culture reference. And, uh, and we made this t-shirt to not, not pay tribute just to Walter, but to the whole D language. It was kind of a joke, right? Um, had a nice quote about D on the back. Uh, but we realized that you can't just put, you know, one, one face on a, on a shirt. It's, a, it's about everybody. So we're really systematic at Sociomatic. So, so what we decided was we're going to go one by Jeez. one through the community. <laughs> and so, Andre, That's... can you, Andre, so I actually, I, I actually have it, I have it here. <laughs> and I also have, Jesus. I also yeah. have it. So this is just a prototype. All right. So this is for you. Oh, thank you. I'm, I'm not going to wait. <laughs> you can talk to Walter or Don about, uh, you know, the experience of wearing your own face on your shirt. It's all, it works. You know, Whenever I see a photo so, of me, I'm thinking I, I look really bad in pictures. And then there's so many that I actually decide I look bad, like, period. So that's, well, that's, what, that's what designers are for. Obvious. They help. So we had, we, had a, we had a prototype made. That's what this is. This is a prototype. We only made a couple prints. It has that on the front. And um, I was speaking with uh, <laughs> one of the prominent D developers in the community, <coughs> Joseph Wakeling. Um, and he said, that's the wrong, um, that's the wrong face. That's it not, is. yeah. He said, that's definitely. not Andre. And he said, you know what you should put on the back? You should put, <laughs> actually, he said, okay. And we were eating something really spicy, and Joe, Joe and I, we get pretty, like, intense from spice. So then we started thinking futuristic, like, oh, okay, video fibers. So we thought, okay, no, let's enhance the shirt to be actually accurate. <laughs> and then, right, there's this moment. I, But, okay, so all kidding aside, um, we really might put one of those frames on the back if you're okay with it. <laughs> right, sure. It says this on the back, which is a quote from Andre uh, leading up to DECONF. Um, we felt that this quote really, like, speaks a lot about community. And what, what we wanted to do, uh, especially from, like, a really creative standpoint, was create this design and then revive the, the Walters, my homeboy design, and give them to the D Foundation and work with them after DECONF over the next months to see how can we produce a line of shirts that could be sold by D Foundation yes. to generate awesome. funding for it. So it's sort of like how can we take a low amount of resources to create energy and to give back to the community. So um, thank, thank you, you, Andre. This is awesome. And thank you, Walter. Yeah. And we're going to make billions off of this stuff. And thank you, Ali, for letting me steal your time. So that's it from awesome. me. Oh, no JavaScript? Oh, <laughs> I was literally like, you know, really sweaty here. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, I think we'll take a short break, and then Dylan's going to be back. Thank you.